good evening. Welcome to this October 5th, 2020 regular meeting of the West Orange Board of Education. Mr. Calabano. Roll call. Mr. Hopper. Here. Ms. Berkinger. Here. Ms. Mr. Rothstein. Here. Mrs. Trigg Scales. Here. And Mrs. Tunnicliffe. Here. Notice of meeting. Please take notice that adequate notice of this meeting has been provided for in the following manner. That a written notice was sent from the Office of the Secretary of the Board at 4 p.m. on January 7th and September 17, 2020. That's a notice was sent by regular mail to the West Orange Township Clerk and the editors of the West Orange Chronicle and the Star Ledger. That said notice was posted in the Lobby Administration Building of the Board of Education. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. May I have a motion for consideration of the public meeting minutes of September 21st? So moved. Second. All right, Mr. Calabano. Mr. Klinger? Yes. Mr. Wolfstein? Yes. Mrs. Tonicler? Yes. Vice President Trigg Scales? Yes. President Albert? Yes. All right, Dr. Cascone, Superintendent Report. Thank you, Mr. Alper. Uh, members of the board and community in attendance and colleagues. Um, great to be here tonight. A uh, lot to uh, lot to talk about, a lot going on. Um, we do have a couple of reports uh, for you tonight. Um, one by uh, Dr. Vespignani, um, our Executive Director of Personnel, and the other um, regarding school reopening uh, by Mrs. Demendez and Mrs. Gogarty, and I'll own a piece of that as well as it relates to the ongoing remediation of the ventilation systems. But prior to that, I just want to start with a couple of um, a couple of acknowledgements. Um, we've had um, we've had some great back to school nights, uh, which have been taking place. All of our elementary back to school nights took place. Our uh, Edison and both middle schools occurred uh, last week, um, and we got a lot of really positive feedback on those. Um, the technology cooperated. And I think that they, um, it was a, it was an inaugurable, inaugural uh, effort for us um, in doing these virtual back to school nights. But uh, we got a lot of positive feedback from parents um, and family members. And so I just want to thank um, not only uh, the staff but also the parents uh, for uh, joining us in that kind of new venture um, and um, and kind of coming along uh, with us for that. So we hope that you found those constructive. And of course, if you had any feedback that you felt could help us improve and get better. Uh, of course, we were, we were open to that and we'd love to hear from you. Um, tomorrow night's uh, uh, is the back to school night at the high school. Um, so uh, that will start at 6.30 tomorrow night. Um, so we, uh, we encourage you to attend um, and hear about all the great things that are going on in our virtual platform there. And there is a, a financial aid uh, workshop that's happening virtually on Thursday night at the high school. Uh, at 6:30. So, for anyone who is in the process of uh, of applying for, you know, children are applying for college, or even if you know you're you're a couple years away, uh, it doesn't hurt to get a jump on that and understand that process and how you can begin to prepare for that. So that's Thursday night, 6:30, um, virtual. Um, our sporting our sports seasons have have officially opened. Um, I want to personally thank um, not only our athletic director, high school administration, our athletic trainers who have been amazing um, throughout this process. When we started phase one on July 15th, we've had a knockwood, a, <clears throat> a really successful, um, really flawless uh, record insofar as health and safety, which we hope to continue. Um, and um, it's great to see our kids out there uh, competing with their teammates. Uh, we had, we hosted a very large event uh, obviously staying within the occupancy guidelines on uh, Friday night. We had our first Friday night football game against St. Peter's, a very strong St. Peter's team, but our, our, uh, our, our guys competed and, uh, and made us proud. But probably one of the highlight moments was prior to uh, the football game when we recognized um, uh, Joe Suriano, God rest in, let him rest in peace, God rest his soul. Um, we were able to recognize him and, um, and have his family come to the game, which was a, a great community moment. And of course, uh, we, we send our, um, 
always our, our thoughts to them uh, for their loss and the loss uh, to our community of, of Coach Suriano. Um, today was also an exciting day for me. I convened uh, the, um, the newly minted Superintendents uh, Equity uh, Student Advisory Council. Um, which was actually something that evolved this summer when uh, uh, one of the student advocacy groups, a relatively recently formed one, uh, Orange Outcry, reached out to me proactively looking to kind of engage me on some matters of equity which were on their mind. And so I engaged with them initially and then, you know, it kind of built into this idea of bringing in other high school uh, student advocacy groups and creating a uh, a superintendent's advisory council. Um, you know, the purpose of it is really for me to uh, to use them as a sounding board to hear from them as it relates to culture and climate. But what we really threshed out today, which I thought was great, was in their voice came out and they said, you know, we feel as if the student voice is oftentimes disconnected from the decision making process. I mean, the the level that these young folks are operating on is 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 really impressive um, and got some great feedback from them. And so really what we came away from it was, was building mechanisms, means by which we can bridge the student voice with the decision making. And, you know, we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel to do that because we have, um, we have means already, but are we utilizing them to their fullest extent, whether it be student government or whether it be the very student advocacy groups um, that are uh, that are already in play. So uh, we will meet again on October 15th. The purpose of that meeting will be to plan really what it, we envision being a student town hall, which is where we can, and we're still working through the format of it, where we really can just provide a means for students to ask questions, students to provide feedback. So really excited about that work and we'll meet on a monthly basis, um, you know, as we move forward with our planning. Um, I'd like to um, acknowledge that today is uh, a world, uh, world, uh, Day of Prevention of Bullying. Um, I think I got that right. I might have I might have massacred the name there, but uh, at any rate, the, the fact remains that it is a day when we acknowledge and we stand unified in solidarity to eliminate bullying from our schools, from our our society. Uh, and there were a lot of great messages out there, and a lot of great things going on through our counseling department to do that. And we obviously are a district with a zero tolerance policy, and um, and we'll continue to work until we have no incidents of HIV in our district. Um, so we acknowledge that. We also acknowledge World Teacher Appreciation Day. Um, and we send our thanks and appreciation to all of our educators. As we know, on a daily basis, they're, uh, they're moving mountains now in a different way, but like they do uh, every day and every year. So we send our thanks and appreciation to all of our teachers, not only in West Orange, but around the world. Um, and, and finally, I just want to call attention to um, uh, an item that's on the board agenda tonight, which is the district goals, the, the uh, proposed district goals for the 2020-21 school year. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want to highlight uh, several in particular, which I think would be of significant interest to the community. Um, one of which um, Dr. Vespignani will be uh, presenting on uh, after I conclude my report. And that is to analyze data regarding the schools where there is a significant disproportionality in regard to diversity between the percentages of students compared to the percentages of staff. To implement a recruitment action plan, plan, monitor the number of diverse candidates hired for the 2020-21 school year, and compare on an annual basis with the goal of closing disparities. So we, you know, we, we heard the community, we agree with the community um, that we need to have a, a, a more um, uh, equitable representation on our professional staff vis-a-vis uh, -vis our student body, and so much so that we have made this um, Pose this as a district goal, and Dr. Espignani will speak to some of the actions we've already taken in order to really um, increase our, our access to uh, qualified diverse candidates uh, to compete for our open positions. Um, the second is to establish district level and school based parent advisory groups, which will meet monthly for the purpose of information sharing and feedback gathering to help inform planning and decision making. So um, I'm, I'm almost complete with the formation of my district group. Um, I'm waiting to hear back from a couple of parents. I've solicited uh, names from the various building principals and I'm really excited uh, to get this group going. I feel between that and the Student Advisory Council, uh, a couple of really effective um, feedback loops and, and collaborative groups. And that's you know, going to be something we're looking to do on all the schools. And whether we, uh, in some schools, we operate under the auspices of the PTA and it becomes a subcommittee of the PTA, or whether it's a distinct group, I'm not gonna micromanage that for the building principles, but the fact remains is that we're looking to create school-based bodies that become regularly meeting forms for parents to share feedback, to, 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 um, to 
to serve as sounding boards for initiatives and things of that nature and to keep those lines clean. And as importantly, for the schools to be able to benefit from the, the tremendous amount of expertise um, that we have within our, our parent community and our family community. Amazing amount of expertise um, that is untapped. And so that will also be one of the purposes of those groups. Um, and, and finally, but certainly not least, is to engage in auditing our school culture and curriculum for equity, diversity, inclusion, in order to provide an equitable school community which respects and values diversity. And, and we are planning on partnering with an outside organization. We're in the, pre, we're in the, uh, the process of evaluating various um, to determine which one would be most appropriate uh, with which to work. Um, we do have, uh, we're looking at Montclair State um, and, and one of their departments there. Uh, we also have uh, another individual, uh, Dr. Deborah Manning, who is actually going to be doing some implicit bias training for us coming up in October, but whose uh, who's, uh, organization also offers comprehensive um, auditing. Um, and it's really just to get an objective view at our systems, to understand where our soft spots are, where our blind spots are, and why. Because that will help inform a, a, a cohesive strategic plan as it relates to equity, uh, access, uh, and inclusion. Now, all of this is happening contemporaneously with, with work ongoing, which we knew we needed to start um, in advance of actually developing a plan, which we knew is valid. And so when we talk about implicit bias training, we talk about um, looking, looking at history, looking at our curriculum, um, ensuring that the historical narratives that we're presenting are are, are inclusive of, of um, you know, of all of our, our, the backgrounds of our students are, are accurate or objective. Um, so this is all work uh, that is uh, ongoing. We hosted um, an ed camp, a diversity ed camp. Um, I believe that was on Saturday, September 26th, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was the date. I attended Mr. Alper, came out and joined, and we were a relatively small gathering. This was organized by Kimia Jackson, Assistant Principal Redwood in Washington, who's also the co-chair of our Diversity, Equity, and Access Committee. Uh, we had some visitors from neighboring school districts. Uh, we had staff members from our own district, and it was a great opportunity uh, to engage in these conversations around equity uh, and access. My highlight personally was uh, there were uh, there was a student or students from um, from East Orange who came to present the student perspective, and that was probably the most powerful, uh, you know, kind of piece that I uh, that I heard on that day. And and it's like a jigsaw puzzle, you know. It's it's not created one's own awareness is not created overnight. It's a it's a gradual process of putting pieces together. Every conversation, every opportunity one has to engage in that work and those conversations fills out that mosaic. Um, and that day and that and that and that opportunity was definitely that for me as the superintendent. So I was very happy and proud to be there. I do thank Ms. Jackson and our district committee for uh, for organizing that. Um, and so those are those are some highlights. I mean, I'm very, very proud of the other goals on here. Maybe not so much the NJ CUSAC audit, you know, but we will have to go through that. And all kidding aside, a lot of people bemoan NJ CUSAC. I know Mrs. Demendez does, <laughs> but 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 I, I do. I look at the NJ CUSAC audit as an opportunity. It's another opportunity for an objective, um, you know, an objective uh, body, if you will, in this case, the, the Department of Education, to come in to look at our systems, to look at our processes, and to identify areas where we need to improve and we need to fill in the blanks. And and you know, I think that's okay. You know, um, so you know, we're looking forward to uh, to seeing how we measure up, and if there are any shortcomings, we'll you know we'll correct those in, in a timely fashion. Um, so that's just kind of a, a window in some of the goals. Um, we're excited by the work and, and memorializing and, and, and really codifying this work in the form of our district goals. Um, so at this time, I think this is a, this is a good segue um, to turn the, uh, the platform over to Dr. Vespignani, our Executive Director of Personnel and Special Projects. In the short time he's been there, been here rather, um, he has been um, you know, very proactive um, about um, you know, starting this work insofar as recruitment and human resources, not only as it relates to diversity, but really uh, strengthening our overall systems as it relates to teacher onboarding, um, evaluation, observation, has done some really great work. So Dr. Vespignani, at this time, I'll, I'll turn the, uh, the platform over to you. Thank you, Dr. Cascone, and good evening, everyone. And uh, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to uh, present this evening and uh, excited to uh, you know, share a little bit about some of the progress that's been made and some of the next action steps and, and a little bit about the data as well uh, with the administration, the board, and, and of course, our community. 
Uh, I'm going to look to share my screen. Um, yep, you're all set. Very well. Very well, so what I have uh, put together, um, recently I completed my uh, third month as the uh, new executive director of personnel and uh, I started a bit of a human uh, capital management system uh, which begins with, with planning and recruitment. So uh, to do that, I've been familiarizing myself with uh, our staff and student uh, data to determine if there are areas uh, where we have uh, disproportional percentages. So I've created this uh, staff and student diversity comparative data spreadsheet and uh, it, it's designed to do just that. Uh, this spreadsheet has been shared with uh, all the administrators in the district. Uh, so uh, principals, supervisors, central office personnel are all aware of some of the areas uh, that we, we will uh, need to target as a result of some of the data. And by target, I mean with our recruitment efforts and looking to diversify our candidate pool. Uh, I should note that uh, all new hires uh, do complete a, st a staff member identification form. Uh, this is a SMID, which is manda mandated by the NJDOE uh, and includes this data. Uh, we then enter this into our tech platform that we use, which is called Systems 2000, and uh, all the staff data uh, was, was pulled from that platform. Uh, the student data, um, so when we have new students and, and their families, uh, they go through the registration process, the data is, is collected at that point, and then we entered into uh, our tech platform, PowerSchool. So in this case, the student data was uh, exported from PowerSchool. So we should note that all data is self-reported. So what this spreadsheet um, shares is uh, essentially a breakdown by school. And uh, the way I have organized it is also by um, the elementary and uh, then the secondary level. Uh, we also have data uh, shared by uh, district overall staff and also then uh, district overall for student. So I uh, have a, um, a breakdown here and I don't want to take too deep of a dive into the data, but I just wanted to kind of highlight and uh, I'll review some of the key data points. Uh, but you see how it's broken down by school and then the uh, different categories uh, where in this case staff and students um, would indicate as part of the process that I mentioned earlier, and then we see some of the percentages. So what, what this does is it provides you know, a significant amount of uh, insight uh, as to where there are, again, significant disproportional uh, percentages when we compare our student body to that of our, our staff. And uh, this first uh, tab is, again, just a breakdown of our uh, elementary level and on the secondary uh, tab then we see our secondary schools, our middle and high school. So we see percentages broken down by school and then we see overall totals at the bottom. And then I also wanted to examine staffing totals. So this includes central office and transportation. So um, this data would not be reflected on the first two tabs. And then in this fourth sheet, we see the breakdown uh, by students. So as a result of um, this data, and again, it's been shared with all administrators, uh, we then want to start to consider what our, our next steps would be. And I should note that, you know, while I'll cover some of the key data points, all of this data is, is really important and none of it should really be overlooked. But what I, I just wanted to highlight here is just some of those key data points uh, where we see some of those um, significant differences. So in regards to Black or African American data, we see that the student population is 20% higher than that of the staff at the elementary level. And at the secondary level, you see a 24% uh, difference. And then in regard to Hispanic data, the uh, student population is 30% higher than the staff population at the elementary level. And at the secondary, we see it's 27%. In regard to two or more races at both levels, uh, the percentage of staff is higher than the percentage of students. Some additional key data points uh, in regard to Asian data, data we see notable differences um, where the student population is higher than that of the staff population at uh, the schools presented on the slide. And the difference here is 8% or higher in these schools. So in other words, the student population is 8% or higher than the staff population uh, at some of these schools that are listed here. In regard to Black or African American data, notable differences, um, student population higher than staff uh, are seen at these schools and the difference is 30% or higher. And then in regard to Hispanic data, uh, some differences we see 
uh, with the student population being higher than staff uh, are in these schools and the difference is 30% or higher. So with all of this data that we now have and has been shared, we start to consider our recruitment efforts and start to um, move in a direction where we are uh, attempting to diversify our candidate pool. And to do that, um, I've developed a bit of an action plan with goals and measurable uh, actions. So the first one is to partner with local organizations, uh, college and university schools of education, for example, um, and the intended you know, measurable outcome here uh, is, is to explore partnerships with a minimum of five new organizations and, and colleges and universities, while also expanding upon some of the partnerships that we already have. Uh, the goal, uh, next goal here is to research and attend uh, additional career fairs. So the district does have uh, a good history of attending uh, various uh, college career fairs. Um, in this regard, uh, looking to expand upon that and attend an additional three career fairs uh, for this school year. And uh, the intended goal here is to expand not just at the uh, college or university level career fairs, uh, but to start to uh, have West Orange have a presence on the regional and also national uh, career fair stage. Also looking to assess the structure of uh, our current Tomorrow's Teacher program uh, at West, uh, West Orange High School. And um, this surfaced when the Diversity and Equity and Access Committee had presented uh, a few board meetings ago when we um, were exploring the, the idea of a homegrown program. So we do in fact have this, it's led by uh, Ms. Mullen and it's a partnership with Ryder University uh, where the students um, uh, can, can earn three uh, uh, college credits. Uh, so I've been researching the structure of other similar programs uh, that may impact uh, ultimately the recruitment of our West Orange students uh, with the goal of, of again, growing our own and then retaining them uh, to join the workforce here. And lastly, uh, any action plan must have uh, a monitoring and evaluation component. Uh, so in this regard, and Ed, as uh, Dr. Cascone had shared earlier, uh, the goal here is to monitor the number of uh, diverse candidates hired for the 2021 school year and to compare that on an annual uh, basis to see if there's growth. So some of the outreach and partnerships, um, I have a list here that I wanted to share and, and just kind of highlight, you know, what's, uh, what's been occurring with these, um, you know, different organizations. Uh, so in July, I had, uh, when I first started, I applied for the Urban Teacher Recruitment Grant uh, through this organization uh, called Selected. And uh, this grant would offer up to $10,000 credit uh, toward paying for the re uh, selected recruitment platform. Uh, although we were notified that um, ultimately we were not selected as a recipient of this year's grant, you know, it's important to explore these possibilities and to apply for different grants uh, that may help us attain this goal. So this would be an example of that. Uh, NEMNET is a national resource organization that assists schools with the identification and recruitment of uh, diverse candidates. Uh, they actually have a local office here in West Orange, and I had a great conversation with the director, Mr. Reed, uh, back in September. Uh, currently, we're exploring their membership packages, and um, one of which does include that national career fair. So they have a national career fair, which will be held virtually on February 6th. Uh, so I've been in the process of contact, contacting other districts who have used um, NEMNET services uh, to determine their levels of success. And, and ultimately, I, I anticipate making a recommendation to Dr. Cascone shortly. The uh, Metropolitan YMCA of the Oranges, of course, we, we have a, a working partnership with them. Uh, I've had some conversations with a senior HR uh, generalist as well as the um, district uh, executive director. Um, so the Metro Y has seven different branches. And uh, back in September, um, we engaged in a conversation to explore different partnerships, uh, one of which is uh, shared postings. So for example, I've shared the link to our district's website where we post all of our um, uh, job opportunities and vacancies. And currently uh, now the Metro, uh, Metropolitan YMCA is sharing these on their internal feed. And likewise, uh, we'll be posting their uh, career opportunities internally for our staff so that in the event that one of our staff members wanted to volunteer or work um, you know, to in, in some form at the YMCA, maybe through coaching or teaching a class, for example, um, we're developing the partnership in that regard. Um, so this is just a great way to get our vacancies out to, um, you know, different local organizations um, in, in an effort to, uh, you know, diversify and, and ultimately have more candidates join the pool. A few universities I've been in contact with. Um, so again, um, back in September, I uh, contacted and, and had a uh, virtual conference with the associate dean of the College of Education and her team. And uh, William Patterson, as they indicated, is the uh, second most diverse uh, college or university in New Jersey. Uh, so uh, we are now posting our job vacancies uh, with uh, William Patterson. 
uh, through an online pl platform known as Handshake. Uh, tomorrow I'm engaging in, in an online um, uh, conference uh, through Handshake. Uh, I'd like to create more of a presence for the district uh, through this online platform as the majority of the schools of education uh, through colleges and universities are now using this platform. Uh, we're also exploring with uh, William Patterson, I had mentioned about a homegrown um, you know, program where we develop our own um, teachers through our, our high school students. Uh, they, they had a really great partnership with uh, Patterson uh, School District, uh, it was the Patterson Teachers for Tomorrow program. It's, while it's no longer in, ex in existence, I did have a, a good conversation with Dr. Hill of the university who led that program and uh, was able to, to take away some key points as we look to augment our, our current program through Rider. And uh, Fairleigh Dickinson, I spoke with the Director of School of Education and the Field Placement Director. Um, I had asked if there were any uh, recent graduates uh, who were still looking for employment. Uh, they sent me a list and uh, in actuality, we at the last board meeting, we actually recommended one and ultimately hired one uh, to serve as a lead replacement in one of our buildings. And in addition to that, um, the university is looking to send more of their uh, student uh, teacher placements uh, to the district, which I really love as a recruitment tool because it gives us an opportunity now with the year long student teaching um, for these uh, candidates uh, to participate. Um, it's a great recruiting tool for uh, these teacher candidates to you know, develop partnerships within the district. Ultimately, they, they know our students, they know our families, they know our programs. And in the event that we, we believe strongly that one could fill a position and they've gone through the application process, it really works as a developmental year, uh, ultimately to place um, you know, one of them in, in one of our, uh, our vacancies. Uh, I, not listed here, but um, one of our uh, current uh, partnerships is through Kane University. So this past Friday, I had a conversation with the uh, Managing Assistant Director. So the district is in fact a member of the Diversity Council on Global Education and Citizenship. And uh, in speaking with the, the managing director, uh, she'd indicated that there are several areas that the district um, you know, can really take advantage of as a result of this mem membership. Uh, so one of which is an upcoming workshop on October 23rd, um, and it comes free as part of the membership. Uh, the workshop is entitled Bias, Prejudice, and Stereotypes, How Do They Affect, of, affect Us? And I'll be sharing this with all staff this week. Uh, it's very simple. It'll be presented through Zoom. Any staff member can participate. So, um, you know, being able to network with all these organizations and, and pull different resources is, is really a great way to expand on, on some of the work that we're doing. Uh, there's also student conferences held through Kane University where our high school students can participate virtually. And uh, also I'm looking to become a local provider for our staff uh, to participate in two tuition free graduate level courses. Uh, these two courses are entitled Teaching the Holocaust and Teaching Prejudice Reduction. Uh, currently we have two staff members participating uh, but these uh, staff members, for example, um, go through uh, either uh, traditional route through Kane for these courses, um, but we have an opportunity to become a provider and actually have the instruction uh, on the campus of one of our schools here, in which case uh, we would be able to get so many more of our staff members, um, if interested, to participate in these two, again, tuition-free graduate level courses. Uh, I should also note in the partnership with Fairleigh Dickinson University, uh, they had um, shared with me and invited me to participate in the third annual convening of Diversifying the Teacher Workforce Conference through Rutgers. Uh, so that's uh, going to occur on October 14th, and I look forward to participating in that event. So I mentioned the human capital management system, and this is just a bit of a flow. And it's important that we don't just think of planning and recruitment in isolation, uh, that we also consider the induction, our staff development, and ultimately, of course, the retention piece here. So I just wanted to share a little bit about what our induction program looks like and some steps I, I've taken to um, you know, uh, add on to this uh, already existing platform. So induction in schools, usually it's, it's new staff orientation in the summer, uh, mentoring for first year teachers, which is a state requirement, and then the professional development days uh, throughout the school year. Uh, programs vary across districts and, and really it's, it's inconsistent patchwork. Uh, but some of the components of our induction program and I feel strongly that we already have a, a very strong foundation. Uh, we know we have, that we have our staff orientation for year one and two. Uh, this is not a state requirement, but essentially the district is offering uh, two years of support in addition to the mentoring. Uh, and this year we are working on um, a virtual model where uh, we will have a launch program with all of our new staff members in year one and year two. Uh, but we're also then uh, moving towards providing a self-paced 
um, program through Google Education, uh, where the staff members will be exposed to training and workshop with a primary focus on instructional technology, which of course works very well uh, during the current times. In regard to uh, mentoring and guidelines and logs, uh, last Friday I had um, provided uh, training for all of our district mentors. Essentially, we are developing a cadre of mentors throughout the district, making sure that good quality mentoring is being provided to our new uh, teachers. Um, the research tells us that mentoring during the first year has a significant impact on retention. Um, so making sure that we are um, not just doing the mentoring from the compliance piece, but also what the research of best practice tells us is really, really critical. Uh, one thing that I've added uh, this year is a 30, 60, 90 day check-in. Uh, so on October 2nd, I conducted this with all of our new staff members. Essentially, it's a one-on-one -on -one with HR, which is a, a neutral, you know, safe place to share, um, you know, how things are going and, and, you know, what are some areas that they need continued support with. Um, I think districts mistakenly allow new staff members to acclimate um, without specific checkpoints or touch points to, to assess the individual's progress and comfort level. And for me, that's really a missed opportunity. And, and I think it really is critical that we have these checkpoints um, while new staff members uh, acclimate to the district. Uh, we also have school improvement panels, which is a state mandate. This is part of Achieve NJ along with uh, student growth objectives and the student growth percentile. School improvement panels, sometimes referred to as SIPs or SKIPs, uh, are part of the mandate. But again, with a focus not just on compliance and on best practice, uh, I've been in, in conversation with all of our uh, principals uh, who will have fully functioning school improvement panels this year uh, to offer another layer of support uh, to our new staff members, which is one of the three responsibilities uh, for the school improvement panels. So in regard to retention, a, a key part of the, the human capital management system uh, is, is setting that inclusive environment. Uh, in some cases, the first contact that a, an applicant has with the district is through our job postings. So. I wanted to take a look at how our messaging to potential candidates uh, offers some information about what's important to the district, our, our values, our, our culture, our goals. Uh, so branding presents this opportunity. So I've made a few small adjustments to the manner in which the district is posting for vacancies and also through the application process that I'll share with you in the next slide. Uh, but I, I think it's really critical you know, if we have this vision for diversifying the Canada pool, that we align that with the messaging connected to job vacancies. So this message list is below is now being used uh, when we post on uh, nj.com or within the Star Ledger. Uh, it's also now posted within our online frontline um, recruiting and hiring platform that we use for our uh, application process. So the messaging suggests and indicates that, that we're seeking collaborative educators um, and the fact that the district provides uh, excuse me, prides itself on the diversity of its student body, um, committed to fostering a culturally responsive staff, and that we encourage applicants from diverse backgrounds uh, to apply for our open positions. And in addition, um, I had mentioned recruiting and hiring, which is our, our online tech platform where uh, candidates will go to formally apply. And in this, they uh, participate in an online application. Uh, and again, this is an opportunity to express the areas that are important to the district in terms of an inclusive environment for both staff and students. Uh, about 70% of school districts in New Jersey uh, use recruiting and hiring. And as part of the online application, uh, recruiting and hiring provides some, some general questions, uh, but it's rare that a district will personalize the questions. So in other words, when a candidate applies to West Orange or if they apply to a neighboring uh, town or uh, one of the of 70% of the school districts who use this, they're being exposed to the very same question, which asks for them to um, outline the, the key attributes that makes an outstanding educator. Not a bad question, but, but not personalized and, and doesn't really say much about West Orange, about the type of applicants and the type of candidates that we're seeking. Uh, so we've adjusted um, uh, the one question to now three questions. And by using our own questions, this really differentiates the districts from others uh, during the application process. So this is an example of, of a standard question that now any applicant is exposed to uh, throughout the application process. We ask for them to share their vision for an inclusive uh, learning environment that ensures students from all backgrounds feel celebrated and included, and that also prepare, prepares them for real life success. Just some additional considerations before I open up to any questions or comments. Uh, you know, I think it's important to uh, foster programs that demonstrate that we value all of our staff members. And uh, these, these programs listed below uh, are in development to assist uh, in establishing an inclusive environment. So level professional growth opportunities, uh, going back um, to Fairleigh Dickinson University, who I, I shared earlier, 
I had a good conversation with the uh, director of the educational leadership program, uh, Dr. Bornstein, who was uh, relatively new to the university. And um, the university, and I'll be launching and sharing this with all staff over the next few months, is offering a cohort leadership model uh, for our staff members who are interested in pursuing either a principal uh, certificate or a supervisor certificate. Uh, it is uh, subsidized tuition, uh, so it's at a lower cost. And the idea is to create a, a cohort for our staff members interested in pursuing uh, this as a professional growth opportunity. Uh, and what I really like about this particular program is uh, Dr. Bornstein has gone through a bit of a refresh as, as he's uh, again new to the university uh, with the curriculum and the core sequence. There is now a thread throughout the program and a focus on social justice leadership. Um, again, looking to grow our own talent and develop our own talent from within. Uh, this presents a good opportunity to, to create a cohort model where uh, any staff member who participates uh, during their internship would be able to tackle some of the issues um, deemed critical uh, by Dr. Cascone and his team. Uh, Dr. Cascone had uh, mentioned implicit bias training earlier, uh, and that's in progress, uh, looking uh, like it's uh, in good shape for a launch in October. Uh, I had read the book Blind Spot a year ago. It was recommended uh, to me from uh, an HR uh, specialist at MetLife. And uh, you know, I fully support the, the implicit bias training. I think it's going to be uh, uh, really, really valuable for our staff members. And uh, lastly, a staff wellness program with the uh, YMCA. Um, they are offering a very generous uh, opportunity for our staff members uh, for uh, reduced uh, membership costs, 20%. Uh, and uh, what I really appreciate about the Y, and to use their, their words, uh, so much more than Jim and Swim, uh, they have a, uh, essentially with the membership, so many other great resources and programs. Uh, one of which uh, would be, uh, it's called Live Strong, and it's for support for families uh, who are experiencing a family member who is going through cancer treatment. Uh, and you know, this is a resource, um, think back to, to my own family, and, and uh, my mother was a retired high school English teacher and uh, was uh, once the uh, president of the Alternative Education Association of New Jersey. Um, sadly, we, we lost her to cancer, but I can't help and think about a great resource that would have been for my family and I at that time. So just to highlight that as an example, um, I think it's really important to show our staff members that we, we, we value them as our greatest resource, right? They're the resource in human resources. And uh, a staff wellness program and an employee assistance program is in development, and I'm really excited to share that with staff um, through the YMCA. Um, looking to launch this most likely over the next month or so and uh, details to follow for our staff members. So uh, that concludes uh, the presentation. I'm happy to uh, open it up to any uh, questions, comments, or concerns. Great. Uh, Mr. Rothstein, anything? Do you need me to unmute for you, Mr. Rothstein? I unmuted okay, you. Did go. you lose the meeting? No, I got it back. Okay. <laughs> I got it. Thank you. No problem. I, I just had my screen hidden behind another screen, so we're good. Um, yeah, thank you. Just a couple of questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Vesvignani. That was terrific. I'm really excited and happy to hear that we've got um, so many great things going on uh, um, to make these changes that are, I think, uh, uh, certainly well, it definitely needed here. So thanks. Um, for, first question, uh, there's a slide on key data points. Um, I don't have a page number here, but uh, uh, the question I had was uh, when we're talking about percentages higher of uh, uh, um, staff compared to student populations, um, who is included in staff? Uh, Thank you for that question. So that includes all staff members at that school. So that would be um, not only teachers, but administrators, uh, lunch aides, power professionals, custodians, nurses, anyone who, who is uh, primarily based at that school. Okay. And do we do we keep um, do we keep stats for um, faculty as well separately, or right now are you just looking at overall staff? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question? Uh, do we keep um, stats as well of the um, uh, percentage uh, differences between faculty and students as well? or right now is the exercise just to focus on staff in general? I see. So uh, I, I would share this as I was going through this uh, review of different data. I, I do see 
Um, I look back at some historical data from 2011 and 2012. It looks like the district at one point uh, had used a, a firm to conduct a, a historical um, analysis of uh, student data. So in looking at that data, it does seem that um, some of the uh, percentages are, are shifting. In other words, it, it seems that the uh, Hispanic or Latino population uh, is in fact uh, growing within the community. So I would say coupled with this, you know, uh, tracking you know, shifts in both the student and staff uh, data. I think what I'm uh, what I'm curious about and, and looking to see is whether, in addition to just hopefully just closing the, the the differences between student and staff populations, that we're also closing differences between student and faculty populations. And um, I, I, I'm just speaking off the top of my head. So if if there's uh, if if the goal if that's not exactly in alignment with goals at this time, then uh, please let me know. But that's something that I'm interested in as well. Um, Thank you very much. Sure, sure. I was also, uh, let's see, another question uh, on the action, the set of action plans. Um, I love the way you broke this out with the goals and the measurable actions. I think that's, a, that's terrific. And then uh, Dr. Cascone had mentioned when he was speaking before about one of the district goals, um, uh, specifically closing with um, uh, a goal of closing disparities. And I was wondering whether do you envision these goals that you've listed here on the ac uh, action plan as all sort of laddering up into that overarching goal, or is it a goal that that belongs really on the action plan as well, um, the the goal of closing disparities? And if so, have we put thought into what that measurable action could be? Right. So I would say that the the action goals listed prior to that on, on my plan all build into that. So yes, and, and the idea is to monitor that. And from a reporting um, you know, perspective. Uh, what we do is when we when we go through the hiring process and that SMID process, uh, we do in fact then enter that data so we can run reports and I can share that with Dr. Cascone uh, so that we can see the um, you know, number of staff who are hired each year and then compare that to the previous year. And um, just to go back to your previous question in regard to um, faculty, are, are you, are you uh, considering faculty just the teachers? Um, Certificated staff. Yeah, I, I, th I think I was thinking more in terms of, uh, of uh, teachers and counselors and administrators, um, but I'm not, I'm, I'm just pulling that definition out right now. I hadn't right. really put too much thought into it. Yeah, we can certainly run the data in, in several ways and pull out different stakeholder groups within the faculty and or staff. Uh, but the idea you know, currently is to, to examine the faculty and staff as a whole, which is embedded in that, that spreadsheet. I think really where, where, where my head is at is uh, the thought of from a student perspective, who are the people who they see most often in their Understood. interactions at the school and making sure that, uh, that, the, that students are seeing themselves represented in the, in the, uh, uh, in the population of the staff as well. Right. Um, and I think I had one last question. Oh yeah, with, with regards to mentoring, um, um, is there any information you could share with us about how uh, how mentors are assigned? And in that case, what I'm thinking about is, I know it can be really challenging when you walk in new to any school as a, as a faculty or staff member, but in particular, if you feel a little bit on the outside and knowing that you're paired with somebody who has a sense of where you're coming from, uh, it can really make a big difference in making you feel comfortable in the environment you're at. Uh, can you speak a little bit to that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So uh, the current process is uh, when a new staff member is hired, we uh, determine whether or not they need mentoring based on uh, their certificate. Uh, so if they're working on a, a certificate of eligibility on advanced standing or a certificate of eligibility, that then informs whether or not we need to enter them into the, to the provisional program and then support them through mentoring as they build towards a standard, for case, uh, standard certification, which is a two-year process. In regard to assigning the mentor, based on that information, uh, my office then reach out uh, reaches out to the uh, their building principal or to the supervisor to see if they have um, you know so, someone uh, within the either department and or within the school building uh, who would um, you know be willing to serve as a as a mentor. Typically, it's someone within um, the same discipline or the same grade level. Um, one thing I'm, I've been proposing and uh, what I really like to see a part of the process is is again to develop a cadre of mentors where um, we have trained mentors who year in and year out understand you know, the, the best practices and what the research tells us uh, and over time are serving um, as mentors. And, and certainly we don't want to 
we would all want to include new staff members as we go along and um, you know build that that mentor base um, but I think it's, it's really important that the mentors go through that training first uh, which is a state requirement uh, so that then then they're exposed to not only the the compliance um, perspective but also the best practices um, one thing I'd really love to see uh, implemented is as part of the uh, hiring process and onboarding process is to ask the actual new teacher some of the the you know areas that they look for in a mentor would they prefer someone in the building or within the department i think it's really important that they have a voice in the mentoring process as well which um is really critical as part of my 30 60 90 day check-in because those who are being mentored it's a good opportunity for me to ask you know, how's the, how's the mentoring going do you need anything else at this time so it's just another layer of, layer of support that's great to hear also thank you so much really uh, appreciate you talking us through all that my pleasure Scouts. Okay. Dr. V, I am so impressed. Three months. <laughs> this this is incredible. This I I'm just um I'm blown away by everything that you've touched in this short amount of time. Um, it's so inclusive. I, I don't, I can't find too many things that I'd like to ask about, but one would be alternate route teachers. Um, we, we have found um, over time some incredibly talented people who are ready to make a career change and who have actually become um, very good teachers. Are we thinking about that at all? Yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing that. And actually, I just came across uh, an opportunity for a, uh, a career fair, which is uh, primarily focused on on alternate route. Uh, so mm -hmm. yes, you know, I, I would agree. And I think that's a, a certainly a, a worthy and valuable uh, process to explore. In other words, for, and as you indicated, staff, potential staff members who uh, may not have gone to, through the traditional route in the School of Education, mm -hmm. but are interested in pursuing a career in education, um, you know, through that alternate program or through a master's program. Uh, so um, Fairleigh Dickinson does have, um, you know, a pretty good program as well on regard to a master's. So I see that a lot of candidates who participate in that master's program are also, um, you know, those who did not uh, go through the traditional route. Um, so that's would be something really worthwhile to explore with the, with the university levels as well. Great. Um, would you explain that NEMNET again? I, I wrote down that there's a local office in West Orange exploring membership packages, but I didn't get the gist of exactly what they do. Sure. I'm happy to expand. So uh, NEMNET is a national organization, but they have a, a local office here in West Orange. And from mm -hmm. what I understand, the director uh, uh, also had children who uh, have gone through the, the school system here. And uh, what they offer is various membership packages uh, where uh, districts or um, they also, it's also offered for universities and colleges and um, you know, private schools. There's different options where you can um, simply post on uh, the NEMNET uh, uh, you know, technological platform mm -hmm. um, and then have candidates apply. Alternatively, you can gain access to uh, their resumes and then you can send emails directly to candidates. Um, a, a package could just be participation in uh, reduced cost career fairs. I had mentioned that there's a national one on February 6th. So that they have a series of different options. And what I'm doing right now is I'm reaching out to school districts who have utilized various options and, as part of the membership, basically to ascertain you know, their success levels and, and you know, if this is something that as a district we would want to pursue. So as I receive some of that feedback, um, I'll then make a recommendation to Dr. Cascone in regard to what I feel might be the best um, you know, package to go with and part of the membership to go with. And essentially, they have an, uh, NEM that has an online platform uh, where uh, they are, uh, have like an internal uh, list of um, uh, diverse candidates. And, mm. and that's really what they're focused on as an organization. Okay. So potential candidates register with them. And then if we have a membership, we have access to, okay. That's correct. Great, great. Um, so you mentioned an additional two years of mentoring we're doing. So would that be first, second, and third year teachers? Right. So in addition to the mentoring, which is the state requirement, in other mm -hmm. words, the one-on-one -on -one mentoring, we have the new staff orientation program, which is for year one. So mm -hmm. while those staff members are concurrently going through the mentoring model, and then we also have a year two. So it's two layers of support 
where the district is offering ongoing induction to these staff members. And the previous model was um, face-to-face you know, sessions on a Monday after school, various topics. This year, and due to the cir- circumstances, we're exploring um, an online platform through Google Education aligned with instructional technology. So I'm working with the, the um, Director of Technology, Mr. Santiago and his team, and we're looking to launch that this month. And uh, I think it's gonna be really valuable for our staff members. We're going to do a launch program where, you know, rather than just send out this new information in an email, we'll do a launch and welcome all the new staff members again as, as kind of a check-in. And, you know, Dr. Cascone and Mr. Mendez will present and share as well. And uh, in that moment, we'll launch the program with these new staff members um, for, for this year. Okay, just curious, how many new staff members do we have this year? New staff members, uh, we have close to 30. And uh, in year two, about the same. Uh, I believe it's 27 in year two. So I would say in all, we'll have close to 60 participating in the new staff orientation program. Okay, so they're getting a double dose year one and then year two. Right, and, and in actuality, and what most districts will do, they'll do new staff orientation in the summer and they'll welcome staff and go through onboarding and procedures. And then in year one, they receive the mentoring. And then in many cases, it's, you know, you're off on your own, good luck. And right. you know, I think we're, we make a mistake in the profession um, you know, to, to do that. So what this offers is another year of support uh, for the staff members as they're acclimating to the profession and to the district. Right, and I, I would even agree some need a third, <laughs> a third year. I really like your 30, 60, 90 day check-in. So that, that's a very nice feature. Um, I also like the personalization of the questions during the application process that gives us the West Orange identity. So I just wanted to um, point that out. What about the mentoring for administrators? How, how is that arranged? How is that set up? Right, so uh, I'm, I actually serve as a certified mentor for the Leader to Leader program, uh, which is a state-run program. Mm-hmm. So when we have a new administrator who uh, is working on um, and needs to enter the provisional program to work towards the state, uh, to work towards the standard certificate, uh, this is also a two-year residency, uh, but that mentor is assigned uh, through the uh, state program, through New Jersey Leader to Leader. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, you highlight uh, a good point that, you know, we may want to explore kind of an in-house even if it's yes. an informal mentoring type of program that's where for, for our administrators mm-hmm. would, would work well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's something that we really, really need to um, expand on is a, a buddy, whatever we want to label that person, but to have someone, as you said, like a, in-house. A peer coaching program. Yes. Mm-hmm. Are you frozen? There you are. Noted. Okay. Okay. Um, and the other thing, the staff wellness piece, that last point that you um, talked about in the employee assistance program, especially now, I think that's, that's really invaluable um, for staff. And again, I can't believe you've done all this in three months. I, at six months, what's going to happen? Just, <laughs> I am, I am so impressed. We, we all are, I'm sure. So Appreciate thank you. you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Merklinger. Um, I have to echo my peers. Um, I think you've done a great job with this so far, um, and I can't wait to see what else you have planned for us. Um, just going back to the um, the data spreadsheet, so obviously our schools are not um, made up of the same number of students um, and faculty, so I'm just wondering about the data points um, when we look at those, you know, so some of the percentages, um, are going to be different based on those schools. And I'm just wondering if we're taking that into consideration um, as we're doing our recruitment um, and how that and how that's looking. So if um, one of our elementary schools has more students than another, obviously the, the percentages are going to be different. So I'm just wondering how we're accounting for that. Thank you for that question and, and a valuable point. So, uh, yeah. On the the last tab, I, I did want to you know re- retain that information. So certainly, you know, when we look at, for example, um, you know, one elementary school and compared to you know another one, uh, and we see you know a much larger student body, um, you know, the the idea here is is to to retain that information in the spreadsheet. Um, so we do see 
you know, those numbers, but in addition to that, the, the percentages as well. So, uh, you know, I do think that, that, you know, your point is, um, you know, I acknowledge that point and, and certainly, um, you know, something for consideration and, and uh, in keeping with the spreadsheet, uh, I wanted to make sure that administrators you know, were able to re uh, review that information as well. No, that makes absolute sense. Um, and, and I think just building off of one of Gary's questions, um, in terms of faculty, we do have some faculty that is shared between school districts. And I know you mentioned that we were looking, or the spreadsheet really looked at um, their home-based school. So is there any consideration for, or how is it determined which one is their home school versus um, some that float between two schools or more? Thank you for that. And you know, I had uh, examined that very question in, in, in uh, preparation for tonight. And um, it's typically uh, based upon the percentage of time that they, they're located in that school. So in other words, we have some staff members who are 80% in one school and 20% in another. Um, so then naturally they would be placed with 80%. Um, in some schools, uh, in some cases, we may have a staff member who is equally split. And um, you know, throughout the onboarding process, uh, when they are, and or if they're reassigned, um, they're, they're provided with a base school, um, and in which case, in other words, uh, well, we're currently using uh, an uh, electronic system for our pay portal, uh, but previously, uh, for example, the, uh, if, the, if the pay stub went to that school, that was considered their base school. So they would essentially be assigned in the cases where they have that 50-50 that split. Okay. Um and you know, I'm happy to see about the outreach and partnerships. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, you might have mentioned on a previous um, meeting that we're also looking at Rutgers Newark to partner with. And I know just from my previous role um, in HR using Handshake, I was in um, college recruitment and I know that we did that with Rutgers, um, the Handshake uh, platform. So I'm just wondering if we've um, done anything with Rutgers Newark. I, I feel like you've mentioned it before, but I'm not 100% on that. So currently I'm looking to expand our presence on, on Handshake. And uh, I'd mentioned that tomorrow I'm participating in a workshop uh, to get some of the, you know, the tips and the, the different uh, you know, access that we have through Handshake. Uh, but we're, we're now in Handshake. I've now connected with uh, various uh, colleges and universities. For example, William Patterson, I mentioned as being one of them. And uh, it's an opportunity to uh, expose our um, potential candidates to our job uh, postings and vacancies. Okay. Um, I think I think Terry and Gary covered all the rest of my questions. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Tanika. Thank you. Um, and again, thank you. I agree that uh, this is quite a bit of work for only three months with us. So I appreciate the report and putting this together. Um, in piggybacking off, off of uh, both uh, Mr. Rothstein and Ms. Merklinger, um, is there an ideal ratio that we're looking to achieve um, based on research that shows, you know, students have better outcomes when the faculty are diverse and look more like them? Is there some a kind of plateau that we're going to look for or um, benchmark that we're looking for to achieve? Thank you for that question. So I, I recently read an article uh, provided through our, our partnership with uh, Hanover Research uh, that was uh, aligned, you know, to that very question. And, and, and you know, based on, on the research from that article, it indicated, you know, any difference 5% or higher you know, is, is worthy to, to, to explore and, mm -hmm. and, and investigate. Okay. Thank you. Um, And let's see. Sorry, I'm looking between my notes and trying to find my questions. Um, and also, um, Ms. Merklinder um, talked about a partnership with Rutgers Nork. Do we also have relationships with Montclair State and Seton Hall? Or those, not, those don't have as many of the students that we'd be looking for? 
I, I believe the uh, district participated uh, in a consortium uh, college career fair at Seton Hall uh, two years ago. I, I'm not sure if it, it was run virtually last year. Uh, mm -hmm. I had attended in a previous district, so I, okay. I know the I know the district I know West Orange was represented there. Yeah. Um, so there is there is that level of partnership, and I, and I, I do believe we uh, have uh, a partnership with Montclair State University now. Universities and colleges, there's various partnerships that the district may have, and whether or not it would apply directly to to this, um, you know, focus, you know, that's something I would have to explore based on those two specific universities. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let me just see. I think I had one or two more questions. Um, and also, if I can expand on the mentoring um, piece, I know we talked a little bit about how they're assigned and you talked about that. Is there, and you talked a little bit about having a cadre of sort of mentors that we can, that are trained up and going to, what is that training going to look like? And have you thought about that at all? Yes, yeah, so there's the, the compliance piece where uh, mentors are required to be exposed to uh, four areas um, so I provided that training, but I think what would work well, similar to check-ins with new staff members is check-ins uh, with mentors. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, mentors are submitting a, a mentor log to my office. And what I like to do is I like to review those to uh, get a sense as to some of the areas that uh, mentors and mentees are discussing, make, make, also making sure that they are meeting the um, time requirements and the meeting dates, um, which are Kind of kind of vague in the regulations but there are some requirements in that regard uh but that just helps me keep uh, a finger on the pulse of you know the mentoring that's going on for our our new staff members and um you know overall i think that ongoing support not just for the mentee but the mentor uh is really critical as well yeah absolutely uh that sounds great and let me just make sure i didn't have anything else uh oh, man, don't um, is, would the board be able to just get a copy of the other questions that you've developed for the um, hiring for the uh, questions that go out, if possible? Yes, I'll, uh, I'll okay. make note of that and I'll share with Dr. Kesson, absolutely. Great. Well, that's all for me. Thanks so much. Appreciate all, right. all your work on this. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, and obviously I have to uh, agree with what everyone else has said. This is a fantastic piece of uh, work and great learning for us. Um, I think the one question I have for you at the moment is on your 30 day check-ins, are you uh, uh, getting any, um, are you getting any learning from it? Any sort of common threads and feedback, anything that we were able to learn from and adjust in our process that people would like to see? Looks like my internet connection is a bit unstable. Um, but if you can hear me, I'll, I'm addressing the question very well. Yeah. Uh, yes, so the feedback overall has been really positive. Thanks for that question. Uh, it seems like our new staff members are in a really good place. Uh, they were very appreciative of the um, front loading of the professional development in the beginning of the school year. They felt that they were really set up to be successful. Um, you know, no, no glaring issues at this time. Uh, I think, you know, for the most part, the takeaway was that they were appreciative that there was uh, um, a checkpoint to see how they are doing um, in addition to some of the other uh, support measures that they have. Uh, but I was really pleased and I had shared with Dr. Cascone that, you know, it really seems that our new hires are, are in a really, you know, good place and um, should things take a turn and hopefully they don't, I'll be there for the 60 day check-in and I, and I always offer my services prior to that date. That's just a formal, you know, kind of benchmark, but I always encourage them to reach out, you know, prior to that, if they need any level of support. Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cascone. Hey, Dr. Bestrignani, we uh, appreciate the presentation and uh, all the work you're doing, um, getting off to a good start. So thank you so much and uh, appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, we are going to transition a touch here um, and uh, speak a bit about um, you know ongoing uh, progress so far as uh, the reopening of, uh, of, of, our, of our school facilities. Uh, to students. Uh, we have three focal points of tonight's presentations. Uh, the first is uh, going to be from uh, Mrs. Demendez, and she's going to speak to uh, the planning timeline that we've been uh, developing in advance of November 9th as it relates to preparing staff 
for the return of students. Um, the second is uh, by Mrs. Gogarty Fitzgerald. Um, and Mrs. Gogarty Fitzgerald is gonna speak in the short term uh, to the, um, uh, the, the commencement of on-site instruction for our autistic populations, our autistic classes starting next week um, with a, a gradual um, kind of staggered arrival of special needs populations between now and November 9th as feasible. Uh, but in particular, what to expect for next week for autistic students. And finally, I'll just close out um, the presentation by speaking uh, to some updates uh, on the status of our, our purchases, um, receipt, um, and uh, retrofitting of uh, various ventilation devices in advance of November 9th. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Demendez to speak to our planning time. Good evening. Uh, so we are preparing to uh, shift or pivot into our hybrid model. Uh, currently, we are in full virtual. The majority of our students are receiving uh, their primary content instruction um, online. Uh, and we do have a series of opportunities whereby students rotate in in person to uh, receive services, intervention, or orientations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, in this pivot now, we're preparing to uh, bring our cohorts in. Um, and so uh, there are two cohorts at the elementary levels, cohorts A and B. And then there are four co cohorts at the middle school and high school levels. Uh, and we're preparing to bring them in um, the week of November 9th. So in order to effectively do that, we need to prepare our staff. We are um, right now planning for the professional development uh, that will take place uh, prior to the week of October 9th, which will include um, instructional strategies around live streaming, around the coexistence uh, between uh, teaching in person and uh, remotely, um, instructional strategies uh, that continue to lean into what effective engaging instruction looks like um, virtually while now um, introducing our cohorts uh, to scaffold to support all of the instruction that's taking place online. Um, we are specifically going to be working through uh, the week of October um, 18th through 30th, uh, those weeks for our secondary and the week of October 26th for our pre-K through five. Um, to facilitate that uh, on our next uh, board agenda, we will see our uh, educational technology uh, team members uh, recommended for reappointment so that they can serve as one um, supports in each building. So we are looking to have at least one person per elementary and then uh, two to three at the secondary levels in each building to support staff. Second, so that they can provide professional development um, and really assist our teachers uh, through the process. This would not take away time from instruction. Uh, this would be, take place during the afternoons, during PD time and or on Fridays during PD time. So this is not a, a professional development time frame that would cause schools to close, for example, uh, like we had to at the beginning of the school year. We would use, again, the PMs or the Fridays. Uh, we would uh, certainly take advantage of our 90-minute professional development sessions uh, that would be coming up, such as October, I think it's the 19th, uh, where we would model what uh, live stream instruction would look like, help our staff begin to uh, pair their devices, set up their classrooms, really start to get accustomed to teaching from the classroom, both live stream and remotely. Um, and then uh, toward the week before November 9th, just making sure that our staff, as they begin to come in, we are practicing how to receive students from their buses, practicing the one-way hallways, reviewing all of the health and safety protocols, uh, practicing some safety drills, fire drills, um, et cetera. That way, once our students come on board, uh, our staff is ready to receive them. Thank you, Mrs. Mendez. You know, so is it interesting? We, we, you know, we had this date, but of course, we, we recognized that there was a lot to do. 
um, you know, that obviously our staff members, you know, couldn't just report on the same day as students and that we'd, because uh, it, it's a completely different uh, mode of operation um, in, in hybrid. Uh, and there's a lot to prepare for. Um, so thank you, Mr. Mendez, uh, and uh, everything you're doing on the organizational side with our uh, our curriculum and our instructional teams. Um, Mrs. Gorgie Fitzgerald, uh, you want to speak a little bit about our planning for um, the uh, the intake and onboarding of our autistic students for next week? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Cascone. So I'm going to be sharing a little bit of information in terms of our return of students next week. Um, so we are bringing back two programs beginning Monday, October 12th via our hybrid model. Uh, we're going to be returning our students with autism and our students with preschool disabilities. So we have two programs that will be returning next week via a hybrid model, in which case each student will be assigned a cohort and will be returning on specific days as outlined by the cohort. Um, we are looking, as Dr. Cascombe previously shared, to begin onboarding students in additional programs sometime prior to November 9th, but we do not have an anticipated return date for the remaining programs. Um, you know, this determination will be made as we're working alongside the ventilation remediation process that Dr. Cascombe will be speaking about this evening. Um, from a safety standpoint, one of the areas of focus for us this week is the distribution of PPE. So we have pretty much everything. We're just waiting for the disposable isolation gowns, which are expected to arrive tomorrow. We have all of the materials ready for distribution and myself and Mrs. Ribeiro will be hand delivering them to the schools this week, um, including desk barriers, um, clear mouth face masks, face shields, the isolation gowns and rubber gloves. Um, this has been communicated with the teachers and we are going to work to get those out this week. Um, an area of focus from the past, like within the past week was just looking at the students who would be returning on specific days and their paraprofessional needs. So um, specifically in our self-contained autism classes, we do have a higher student to staff ratio. So looking at which students will be returning on given days and outlining paraprofessional assignments to ensure that we're in compliance with student IEPs. So that's been an area of focus. Um, in terms of communication, some of, some of this I shared at the September 21st board meeting, um, but Mrs. Ribeiro and I had the opportunity to meet with both the teachers of students with autism as well as teachers of our preschool students with disabilities um, about two weeks ago, um, or no, three weeks ago, September 18th. Um, we met with the paraprofessionals in both programs the week of September 21st to discuss the return to school. Um, in terms of parent communication, we sent a letter to parents um, via school messenger and um, a hard copy regular mail in English and Spanish, um, you know, informing them of the return to school. Um, at this time, each student has been assigned a cohort and the building principals are sending a follow-up letter to inform parents guardians of the cohort. Um, I believe Mrs. Salambino already sent that information and the um, principals that have the autism programs in their buildings will be sending that by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, we've made sure that the school nurses are aware of the students return and they will be given the final list of the cohort information by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, and we just had a final meeting with each building principal and staff um, that are anticipated to return next week. We had those meetings this afternoon. Um, in terms of transportation, the information regarding the students and the cohorts that they're assigned to has been provided to the transportation department. So they are working on routing the buses and we'll be sharing that information with parents by the end of this week. Um, so it's really, you know, I have to say it's been an ongoing collaborative process. As Dr. Cascone mentioned just about the return on November 9th, there are many layers to the process. So I do have to give a shout out to the teachers and power professionals because they've been extremely supportive and collaborative throughout this process. Thank you, Mrs. Gogart Fitzgerald. We appreciate that, and um, you know we've we, we've been working um, uh, very aggressively um, to to try and expedite um, this. You know the, the timeline, particularly you know in, in particular for some of our specialized populations. Um, understanding, you know, on the school side, the challenge uh, that's presented by. Um, educating those children virtually and the challenge that's represented on the family side um, in not having uh, on-site instruction. Um, that being said, we're not doing that with, um, you know, throwing caution to the wind and, and um, 
uh, you know, kind of um, putting in place the, the ventilation remediations that we have previously discussed. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, I did, yeah, I did put up a post on social media today, but I understand, you know, not all folks are on social media, but I was uh, um, excited to, to, to learn that um, the uh, 194 of the EnviroCleanse uh, portable units, uh, which, which we purchased, um, have arrived. They are in our bus garage um, and they are presently being retrofitted um, with the uh, needlepoint bipolar ionization uh, mechanism. Okay, um, now what this will do is, and I'm going to go over it a little bit, is the, these, these units in of themselves are already operating with a HEPA filter and a UV light in of themselves. So even in of themselves, they would also re all, already represent a fairly reliable and effective uh, purification mechanism. But we're taking it a step further and we're doing a retrofit to these devices to add the needlepoint bipolar ionization technology to it, which has actually been empirically tested against COVID. So th this is going to really ensure that our rooms and the air quality in our rooms um, is at the highest level possible and that our staff and students are as safe as possible. So because this work is happening even, even ahead of timeline, um, October 23rd will be when all the upgrades to the 194 units are made, but we will certainly have ample units that will be able to deploy to these classrooms where the autistic students will be coming in. Now, some of those units will remain in those rooms because some of those rooms will actually be remediated with the installation of a BPI unit on the existing unit. Event. Um, some of them will then be relocated to places where they're needed, which are classrooms that have no, no mechanical ventilation but have windows. Um, but in the interim, I've spoken to Mr. Ziggy today, um, and we will have enough of those units retrofitted and prepared to deploy in advance of the October 12th start for students and ensure that those classrooms have the necessary purification devices installed. Um, the, uh, the BPI materials for the univents and the rooftop units are arriving as we speak, um, and the installation schedules for those are being developed now with an emphasis on identified special services rooms um, that will be starting on 10-12 so that that mobile unit can be removed as soon as possible. Um, if all BPI equipment is received by Wednesday, October 7th, which it's looking good for, the all installer feels confident um, that um, that all that will be installed by the, the installer is also confident that now the equipment is arriving on site that the November 9th deadline will be met or exceeded. So um, you know our supply the supply chain Knockwood has not let us down. Materials are coming in. The work's happening, and we're excited. It's looking very very promising um, that we will have all the equipment in installed and ready to go uh, by November 9th. So I'm pleased to report that. One final piece, Mr. Alp, before I turn. Um, platform back over to you um, is as it relates to school security drills because I know this was something that had come up in some previous feedback. Um, we, we work with uh, security consultants from Stonegate Associates uh, who have helped us and work through our COPS grant and a number developing our security protocols um, and uh, we had uh, we had Errol Brudner from Stonegate Associates uh, attend a recent training with the state. He is coming to our leadership team meeting on Wednesday, October 7th uh, to train the principals and the administrative team on any necessary uh, modifications uh, to our, our school security drilling protocol, uh, not only to account for the fact that not all students are in school on a given day, but also by virtue of the social distancing, some of our drills uh, become difficult or impossible to do um, with that social distancing. So he will be coming and presenting to our team. So we have updated protocols that we can use once our students uh, return to school as early as October 12th. Um, and that is uh, uh, my report, our report, I should say, uh, for this evening, and we'll open it up to questions. Sure. Um, board, any questions? Mr. Rothstein? Uh, yes, thank you. Just one. So much good news tonight. Um, it's good to hear. Um, uh, Ms. Mendez, when you were speaking about um, uh, about instruction for teachers on uh, live stream instruction, uh, the way I'm, I'm hearing that is, uh, how to teach uh, um, both to the students in the classroom and um, to the students who are attending virtually at the same time. Are you able to share with us anything about what that training will look like? What will teachers see by way of um, um, how they're going to learn to best manage that, that situation? 
Sure, uh, we're developing that now. Um, however, uh, what we do have is a, uh, a site, a district site that will have uh, various tutorials uh, on that site, uh, one of which would be uh, videos of how the two coexist, um, different uh, learnings from Cornell University and some things, the resources that they've published. Also, uh, we will have approaches to instruction and strategies such as assigning roles to students and how to engage students um, um, on the Zoom and while engaging students on the in-person, uh, how to rotate uh, through the different groups with small group instructional strategies, approaches to learning itself. So uh, what should students expect and what types of assignments or um, small group instruction or engagement with the instruction is appropriate for virtual learning. Um, we have, again, a team of teachers who will actually go into the classroom. Uh, we're thinking or we're targeting for as early as Friday uh, to begin to physically stand in the classroom, turn on the computer uh, that's a hard desk, right? Uh, and then turn on the laptop and walk that scenario through with um, uh, many of us on Zoom calls, right? So if we're simulating being at home like students and the teachers are simulating being in the class, really walking that through, these are the trainers, right? And see what does this experience produce uh, therefore, what do we need to teach into? Uh, so I think October 9th will be the beginning of a week of um, walking through it as trainers and feeling it and then developing something comprehensive for our staff. Um, and then moving into the more technical things such as how do I pair my AirPods to my laptop? How do I um, make sure that my smart board is synced on my computer so that I can uh, share content and videos and have the use of those technological tools that are available to me on the smart board. Um, how do I use that in order not to share my screen and cause the black screens that we're experiencing? So really a lot of those technical tutorials um, we are also preparing for. So approaches to instruction, approaches for learning and the technical side and then actually being in the classroom so that when our teachers are ready to come uh, to the schools for the training, we will have virtual learning to front load content, but then actually have teachers in classrooms and at least one trainer per building available to work with the teacher to help them set up their classrooms, try it out and see how it works. Uh, two weeks ahead of time so that we have those two weeks to kind of work out any technical glitches that we would um, almost definitely plan for, right? Great, it sounds like you've clearly put a lot of uh, thought into uh, planning for this. So thank you so much. Uh, fingers crossed that this is all gonna go uh, as well as it sounds like we're prepared for. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Trick Scouts. Hi there. Um, yes, it sounds so thorough, <laughs> like you've thought of everything. Um, just wondering, and I guess this is for um, Mrs. Gogarty Fitzgerald, concerned about the percentage of staff and students not returning um, to those two specialized populations that we're bringing back. So yes, we have some students who are remaining fully virtual. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we do have a plan to service the students that are remaining virtual as well. Um, we have, you know, in many cases, we have students that have a one-to-one -one paraprofessional or a one-to-two. So we have the paraprofessionals that are going to be prepared to work alongside the teacher to provide a level of instruction virtually. Mm -hmm. And are all the teachers um, returning or, or have some of them chosen to, well, um, it's hard to do that virtually though. <laughs> yes, thank, yes, thankfully all of our teachers um, are anticipated to return. We haven't oh, had that's... anybody who put in for a leave. Um, and we have nine uh, teachers of students with autism and eight preschool teachers. So we're double wow. thumbs up there. <laughs> wow, that is fabulous. Uh, yeah. Kudos to and our same, staff. Same with paras as well. Um, we haven't had any paraprofessional in either program request a leave. So I, I do have to give a shout out to both. 
Yes, yes, <laughs> as do we. Shout out. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. That that's it, and that that's wonderful. Everything sounds just great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Merklinger. Um, so I'm definitely excited to hear about um, a lot of the the progress and moving forward. Um, so just to confirm, the idea is that the week of November 9th, all students will be returning um, to school. Do we still have a deadline for those that want to opt out virtually? Um, and what are we expecting to see um, our gen ed population? Is there a limit on the number of students we can have in a classroom? So uh, November 9th, uh, all students will begin to return in their cohorts. So. Uh, for example, uh, on that Monday, cohort A would attend for their two consecutive days. And then on the Wednesday, cohort B would attend. And at the high school, right, and middle school, we have the rotations. So the week of November 9th, we will begin the cohort rotations. Uh, in terms of parents who have filled out the form requesting uh, full-time remote, we have 696 parents who have requested full-time remote um, on the English form, an additional 51. On the Spanish form, uh, those uh, parents or students, shall I say, uh, will not return to school. They will continue with a uh, full virtual. We will re-send out a confirmation of, of those um, results from the form uh, the week of, I'm just going to look at my sheet 19th. Here. The 19th, right? So we'll send out uh, just a confirmation to those parents because someone might have changed their mind since we first released the forms now. Uh, and it, the, the uh, confirmation will just say to the parents, you have uh, filled out this form asking for your child to receive full, uh, full virtual instruction. Would you like to continue to do so? Um, and if not, please let us know and then we'll adjust our numbers accordingly. Uh, how many students can fit into a classroom? It depends on the class size, square footage. Um, and so each uh, school has a schematic for each of the classrooms. All of the principals are aware of how many students are permitted into a class with the social distancing. And so then we've built our cohort numbers and structures around those numbers. So I know um, prior to going virtual, we had a guideline that was a 45 page document um, that I know our parents appreciate it. And definitely it was um, a wealth of knowledge. And, and um, I'm just wondering if we're going to put together something along those lines, um, just more of a comment than a question, but if we were to do something like that and probably a refresher is needed on what the hybrid model is going to look like and with these cohorts, cause I'll be honest, I forgot that we had already put this out there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just, you know, maybe putting that out there, if we could do that sooner than later to parents um, and, and for our staff. Um, I'm just also wondering if, a, you know, are we going to be changing classrooms? So I know at the fourth and fifth grade levels, we had started to do that. Um, and I'm just wondering if we're still planning to do that. And if, uh, if in any of our classrooms, the full class were to return and, and no one opted to be virtual, um, you know, I, is that a possibility? Do we see that possibly happening? And how could, um, are we prepared for that? Right, so um, yes, we've developed a manual for hybrid. It's almost finished. So we would anticipate uh, releasing that in about two weeks. Uh, that is for parents and teachers. So it will be a parent student guide and then it will have its teacher components. So um, that's, uh, again, it's almost, uh, through the different teams for editing. Um, the cohorts were designed based on everyone returning to school. So uh, each of the cohorts are um, simulating if every single student decided to return to school. Uh, therefore, once the students who have um, decided to go full-time virtual have been removed, what we would have is just more space in our classrooms and then we could potentially think about would we want to alter our hybrid model at all. Uh, but we felt that that would be the best way to go. So that way parents can decide to, uh, after giving it, um, um, you know, as, as long as they need to feel comfortable and safe, 
that they can opt to write us and to say, I'd like my child now to participate in hybrid, and then we wouldn't have to adjust schedules, right? We could just readily start to receive those requests and um, return our students to school. And is the expectation um, for November 9th that all of our teachers will be on site as well? Uh, that's that's the plan. Uh, I, I would defer to Dr. Vespignani and Dr. Cascone for specifics on who's returning, but that is the plan. All teachers present in our schools teaching from their classrooms. And I think one of the um, items we have talked about in the past, and just to confirm it, um, for, for our teachers when they are on site, um, I imagine that having to teach live instruction while also teaching virtually is a bit of a challenge and difficult and definitely an adjustment um, to typical learning. And I know virtual learning right now is has its challenges. Um, and I think some of our teachers feel, you know, and, and I've seen it personally, just my husband alone, um, they're doing more work than they ever have before, just keeping on top of everything. Um, what do we, I know you mentioned there were resources that our, our teachers uh, and faculty could access, but will they have a second, and I, this I think was discussed um, at earlier board meetings, will there be a second teacher in the classroom or an aide or a para um, that's assisting with students who are virtual while uh, a faculty member or teacher is working with the students live? For our pre-K uh, pre through three students, um, we believe that we have just about enough staff to have two per classroom. Uh, there may be instances where that's not possible, but we believe we have pre-K through three at, at large covered. Uh, grades four and five, they are teamed, so that way uh, they're working together in a model that will, again, simulate having the two teachers available because they are departmentalized. Back to your earlier question for the elementary levels, we do not anticipate them moving from classroom to classroom. So they will remain in their homeroom and then the model would facilitate uh, the instruction, whether it be in person or virtual. Uh, for our middle school and high school, we do not have that number of staff. Uh, those staff members will then have the devices that they're using in order to attempt to facilitate the instruction. We are exploring uh, different technology and or um, models that could potentially deliver for us a hybrid slash um, uh, virtual model. Again, that's an, ex an in exploration. We'll see if it's feasible. If so, it, it could be promising, um, but we're in exploration right now to see what kind of uh, solutions we could provide. Uh, other than that, it would be providing teachers with strategies um, strategies from other schools, other countries that have proven to work um, in those environments. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as we've said from the beginning, uh, if there is an instance in which we need to modify and adjust our plan, we will do that. We will be prepared to do that. Uh, we check in with our staff uh, at the end of the week. We will continue to hold our listening sessions. We've already completed all of our elementary listening sessions. Uh, we will now start secondary listening sessions. Um, and when we push into the hybrid, we will monitor that. We will hear from the staff and see uh, what, if any, changes or adjustments need to be made. Um, and just one last, I guess it's more of a comment um, versus a question, but in that guideline um, booklet or manual that we're going to share with parents and faculty, are we providing or are we expected to be providing um, PPE for all of our students and faculty? We are providing PPE for faculty. Dr. Cascone, um, I don't know that we're providing it for students, are we? Um, for students, we, um, for those students who, who need or want, we have. I mean, we're, our, we're hypothesizing that many students will bring their own masks, will wear their own masks, but in the event that um, we have, you know, we do have available inventory for students who need them. Thank you. All right, Ms. Tenniglin. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think Ms. Merklinger asked one of the questions that I had about the two teachers uh, in the classroom. Um, with regard to the autistic program, um, I just wanted to understand the timeline. So the 
the cohort information is going out tomorrow to all of the families and then by the end of the week they're going to be getting their bus schedules yes. did i get that correct okay um in terms of the bus schedules are the bus have the bus drivers do they know their routes will there be time for them to learn the route prior to monday if the schedules are only going out at the end of the week you know, and I would have to follow up with Mrs. McFarland on that. Um, I know that, you know, because we're bringing in such a small population, I don't think we yeah. require as many, you know, buses, but I can follow up and get back to you on that. I know it's always a, a pain point for some of our families and has been in the past. So I just want to make sure that we're, um, you know, we've got that locked down so that uh, we know what the drivers know where they're, where they're going and what kids need to be picked up and especially with the social distancing. Um, and then it sounds like um, this question is for Mr. Mendez. We talked about sending out the survey again or make, I know it's live, I think still online, but we're gonna reconfirm with the families prior to coming back November 9th so that they have an opportunity to possibly change their, um, their designation of whether their student was gonna do the the high flex or the um, or the virt full virtual. So, yeah. okay, great. Um, and I think that was all my questions. So thank you. All right, and for my part, I think uh, everyone's covered it. So Dr. Cascone, if you wanna wrap that up. Yeah, well, listen, I just wanna thank uh, the team members who were on tonight, um, outstanding work. Um, and uh, we appreciate everything you're doing. And uh, that, uh, Mr. Board President, uh, concludes our report for the evening. All right, great. So we'll move on to questions from the public on agenda items, including these two presentations. So if you have a question on anything on the agenda, again, including these two presentations, uh, Lauren will walk you through the instructions. Uh, be sure to give us your name and your address and you'll have your three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, so if you would like to speak, it is the raise your hand uh, button function at the bottom of your screen in the center. And uh, we do not have any, uh, we do have some call -ins, So if you would like to speak, it is star nine and you just have to push it once. Okay, and again, you can push it at any time. It puts you into the queue. You do not have to wait for anyone to finish speaking. So uh, Melinda Huerta, if you can follow the um, prompt on your screen, please. Hello. Hi. Hi, good evening. My name is Melinda Huerta. Um, I did have a few questions and I wasn't able to be here in the beginning uh, about the uh, budget. Uh, let me see, let me pull up my notes. So I do have quite a few questions. Uh, I do see uh, budget line items for preschool grants and preschool expansion grants that has been left empty. Uh, is there any particular reasons why um, have we not applied or just there's just no info. There's, I see it on the um, budget, but just no further information on that. Um, my next question would be in regards to the grants. Is there any information available on how many grants we did apply? I do see that we did receive grants for Title I and Title II. We also received for the CARES Act grant and a Chinese program grant. Um, are there any grants that we applied for and didn't receive? Is that information available for us? Um, another question I think I had for the budget was under expenditures, there is a line for state projects and there are many things listed that are non-public items. Is there any more detail on what those are? Uh, let's see. Um, there was also some undis undispersed expenditures and is that due to the school closings? I'm not sure. Uh, what the what that exactly means um and rent and royalties there's large numbers uh, also there there's um it's not balanced so i was just wondering if that was also due to the closures um <laughs> sorry i have quite a few questions there's a lot of information provided for these uh this meeting this evening um for the board of ed goals i didn't see the goals on the website for the 20 for 2017 2018 school year um, are those not available for any specific reason? And for the current Board of Ed goals for the 2020-21 school year, uh, goal number four is uh, district-wide uh, 
policy manual, I know that we're comparing it to Strauss Esme. Is there a plan to consider a district wide dress code for that? And I think that's all my questions for this evening. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, thank you. And uh, Carol Ann Holland, if you can please follow the prompt on your screen and uh, your name and address for the record, please. Hi, Carol Ann Holland, 71 Lawrence Avenue. I just had uh, a comment. First, I loved everything I heard about the um, equity and diversity. And um, wow, that was a lot of work. I would like to encourage that you also include disability in your thinking whether it be learning disability or visual impairment or physical disability, which often gets forgotten, um, just to keep that in the back of your mind. So if you're looking at curriculum or anything, to make sure that um, kids are represented there. I'm wondering when school is back, will there be longer passing times because of the one-way hallways? Um, the high school especially is such a maze that I wanna make sure the kids have time to get where they're going. Okay, um, Ms. Gogarty Fitzgerald did say that autistic students were able to stay virtual. I'm thrilled that some of them are coming back. I'm curious how large the cohorts are um, of the autistic students. And also the virtual form, uh, I didn't ever fill it out because I wasn't sure what the date it was required by. It sounds like you're only sending a letter to those people who did fill it out. Um, I'm wondering if now that we know more plans and we're closer to the timing, if perhaps it should go out to everyone again. I can tell you that your number for the English speaking families should be 698 because my two boys will continue virtual for now. And it sounds like if we change our minds, it won't take that long to reintegrate them into their cohort. But I just wanted to double check that. Um, and I think that was it. You guys are all doing an amazing job. I have knots in my stomach thinking about the return and yet you guys have been doing this for months and seem to have it all under control and it's, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Tez Roro, if you can please follow the prompt on your screen. Good evening, everyone. Um, 24 Hutton. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Excellent. Okay, good. Um, thank you so much for all the work that has gone into this. I really appreciate um, the transparency in all the work that's being done, whether it's the ratio that was uh, called out today or just the way we communicate, even simple things like adding, you know, the Board of Education meetings at the end of the academic calendar. All of this really helped enable parents stay engaged, I think, when the information is available. So I appreciate all of that attention to detail. I think I have more of suggestions than direct questions. Um, the director of personnel talked about, or maybe there was a question posed to him about sort of belonging to new hires and existing hires as well, right? So I wonder if there's any outside of, you know, fit for the role, if there's any effort being made in really understanding what that professional's interests are or passions are. Um, I'll give an example. When my son's teacher sent out a Google form earlier um, prior to school, you know, starting asking me, you know, and every other parent about, you know, is there a nickname? Is there, you know, holidays that we celebrate versus don't? Like, I already felt like part of, you know, that community and, and felt accepted. And so some, some intentional, something like that to really better understand our teachers and, and allow them to bring their whole selves to work would be great. Um, in terms of job posts, I would just like to encourage um, as a, as a district to use more of like, you know, grassroots um, um, routes in addition to the main ones. And I'll give a prime example here in town for an organization, we just hired an executive director role for a nonprofit. And, you know, we ask each candidate where they heard about the job and some heard from a Facebook group, you know, some from the patch or whatever. And the person who ended up, you know, hiring happened to have come with a local Facebook group. Right. And it was a dynamic hire. And so I think I know that some of the Board of Education members are very active in, in local social media and, and do a good job of sharing out meetings and stuff like that. 
Um, I think, you know, using something like that would be great to reach the greater uh, population here. And also, um, I understand that there may be some database for alumni. Um, do we ever kind of share opportunities with that list? If not, I think that would be a great opportunity. I'm sure folks who went to school here may have, um, you know, skin in the game and interest um, to teach the younger generation. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And at this time, do we have anyone else who would like to speak on any of the public uh, on the agenda items? It's the raise your hand button at the bottom of the screen, or if you're one of our call-ins, it's star nine. Okay, seems that's, that's it. All right, uh, Dr. Cascoon, anything? Sure, thank you, Mr. Rupp. I'll just respond to um, a few things. I, I think uh, Ms. Holland's recommendation for the re-release of the surveys is an excellent one um, and we will do that. Uh, I think it's a good move just to you know kind of reframe it now that you know the, the date is, is upon us. Um, you know we, we also the board also did uh, adopt a remote learning policy um, which we're just waiting to get the final copy back from Strauss Esme um, and I'll follow up with them tomorrow on that. I think that'll be helpful for the community members because it does speak to the different timelines required both for going from virtual to hybrid and hybrid to virtual. Obviously the hybrid to virtual move is less complicated um, whereas the virtual to hybrids a little bit more logistic because we have to ensure that uh, the school is aware that now the student will be reporting so on and so forth. But the long and short of it is, is that um, as a parent, as a family member, guardian, caretaker, if at any point in time in the year you want to usher in a transition for your child in either direction, you know, we'll be able to do that for you. It's just a matter of having the adequate time to make sure that it's done um, effectively and safely. Um, you duly noted about the board goals. Um, we should definitely ensure that those are, are, are uh, posted. I have to double check to see that that's happened. As far as goals from a year gone by, not sure about that, but we'll try and locate them if we can. Um, as far as the preschool grants, preschool grant, is somebody on, in here not on mute? I was just about to say, uh, Mr. Calavano, if we can uh, have you mute. Is that, yeah, okay, very good. Um, Thanks. So with the preschool grant, you know, the, the preschool grant is tough because the, you know, the preschool grant does not, it's not a grant for physical plant, right? So, you know, you can't use it for rent. You can't use it to obviously purchase a facility. Um, you can't even really use it to retrofit a facility. It's really to subsidize and fund um, an, an existing facility. Um, so at such time that we expand and we create a new, uh, we create a new, perhaps a new facility, a larger facility, or we're renting a new facility, um, an expanded facility, then we'd be able to apply for the preschool grant to help um, subsidize some of the costs associated uh, with that. Um, but until such time, it doesn't, it doesn't really, it really, it's, it's not really something that would, um, um, be, you know, that we'd be eligible for as a result of that, which is why the district hasn't gone after it to date. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else here. As far as dress code, yeah, you know, I think we've, I think we've kind of, um, it's, it's taken me about 25 years in the profession to figure dress code out. And I think I finally have it figured out. Um, and, and it comes down to, uh, it really comes down to, to case law. Okay. Um, which is, um, you know, in the same way we approach, you know, any kind of a dress code violation is distraction to the learning environment and teaching and learning in the building. Not perceived distraction of teaching and learning, but actual distraction, where it is literally causing a disruption in the school environment where we're not able to actually do what we're supposed to do. If it offends your sensibility. Now, we're not talking about, you know, so, you know, a drug, drug paraphernalia, uninsured alcohol, hate speech. I mean, there are certain things that are absolutely forbidden and, and represent dress code violations for different reasons as they relate to illegal activity. But simply, perceiving that it's disrupting the environment or even perhaps offending one's sensibilities on some level does not qualify for a dress code violation. And I think that that's something we've kind of realized relatively, relatively recent. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's a student prerogative 
and it's a parent prerogative to some extent, what a child wears to school. And if it is not disrupting the classroom environment or the learning environment, then it should not be cited as a dress code violation. And that's really, and I'll state that publicly, that's really how I feel about dress code. That being said, the board is in the process of updating its policy manual and the dress code policy is one that we are looking at. The one we have on record now is, there's nothing there. It's generic and very brief. Um, but when we get to that, um, that is a conversation that we can have, you know, the board can have. I mean, that's just my opinion as an administrator responsible for enforcing. Certainly, if the board had a different philosophy on that and wanted to promulgate that into policy, that would be the will of the board. That's just my opinion as an administrator. Um, and and that, is, uh, that is all I have, Mr. Alper. Thank you. Yeah, I think when we workshop uh, that batch of policies, we'll, uh, I'm sure, have a conversation on it in that workshop. All right. Uh, President we, Alper? Yes, sir. I just have a couple of follow up sure. questions uh, or answers. Um, regarding the board secretary's report, when you look at the local sources, and if you see a positive number in the unrealized column, that means that we did not obtain the full anticipated amount that we were hoping to achieve during the school year. So when you look under rents and royalties, we anticipated 155,000, but because we were closed in March, we only obtained about $60,000. So that's why you see a $95,000 positive number, meaning that we are short 95,000 in that category. Um, when you talk about the, when we look at the state projects, um, they're basically all non-public uh, monies, textbooks, auxiliary services, nursing, technology. So when you see uh, an imbalance in those accounts, that means that the non-public schools did not use their full allocation. And what that means for us is that we need to return that money to the state. We don't have that option to use those additional funds. But when you look under federal funds, if you do see a balance under the federal funds, we have an opportunity to carry them over to the new school year. So we don't lose this money. This money is actually carried over to the following school year. And then I know you mentioned there, there was a question regarding preschool uh, expansion. You have to remember that this uh, actual report is designed for many school districts in the state of New Jersey. So you may see programs listed on here with absolutely no totals for West Orange. All right, great. And it's worth just reminding everybody that the non-public funding, uh, non-public schools receive money from the state of New Jersey, but it's distributed through the local public school. So it's money that, it's, it's just a pass through for us. It's, it's never ours. We're just sort of responsible for kind of holding the money until they order whatever they're going to order. And if they don't order anything, it goes back, right? That's correct. And one other point, uh, the board goals, they are listed on our website. Um, if you go under the tab uh, Board of Education under board goals, you'll see the 2021 board goals listed. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Uh, may I have a motion for personnel items one through four? Uh, yes, moved. Second. All right, let's congratulate some retirements here. Uh, Diane Koval, 32 and a half years at uh, Hazel. Uh, Bob Siggy, Buildings and Grounds. Uh, Mondaldo Sisters from Kelly and St. Cloud. And uh, Daisy Tello from St. Cloud. Congratulations, everybody who's retiring. Any discussion? All right, Mr. Calabano, let's vote. Mr. Mark Unger. Yes. Mr. Rothstein. Yes. Ms. Tony Club. Yes. Vice President Trigg Scales? Yes. President Alper? Yes. All right, next curriculum and instruction, items one through three. May I have a motion? So moved. So moved. Okay, second. And I just want to thank the uh, Italian American Committee on Education for their uh, grant, which is always wonderful to receive. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Calabano. Mrs. Mark Winger? Yes. Mr. Rothstein? Yes. Mrs. Tunnicliffe? Yes. Vice President Trigg Scales? Yes. President Alper? Yes. Next, finance, uh, special services items one and two, and business office items one through nine. May I have a motion? Uh, yes, moved. So moved. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Can I just ask a question on this uh, number two? That is something that we've already, that's already in our budget or is this in addition? Under special services? Okay, thanks. 
Anything else? All right. Mrs. Kirklinger? Yes. Mr. Rothstein? Yes. Mrs. Tunnicliffe? Yes. Vice President Trick Scales? Yes. President Alper? Yes. And next, miscellaneous item one, district goals. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I would just like to um, commend Dr. Cascone and the uh, district for number one, two, three, four, the fifth one, uh, the school-based parent advisory groups, district level and school-based parent advisory groups. That's one I've been yearning for for a while, so um, I'm happy to see that. Um, can we talk a little bit about the five-year strategic action plan, Dr. Cascone? What, what does that entail? Uh, Dr. Cascone, you're muted. You know, I, I just actually, once again, I, I like when you remind me that, so I intentionally leave it on you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can chime in from the wings. And, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> right. So the the strategic action plan, the you know the the breadcrumb, the breadcrumb trail on the strategic action plan has gone cold a little bit. Um, you know, this was a plan that was done several years prior to my arrival. Um, you know, last year was obviously a wacky year for a lot of reasons, <clears throat> but technically this plan is supposed to be completed as of 2021. We also know that the year prior to me coming here was a bit tumultuous as well um, insofar as moving initiatives forward. So it's high time um, that we really to really unpack this plan, understand what we've accomplished in the original plan, what we haven't, what's still relevant, what's not, are there action steps that are now that make sense um, in, in the in the current in the present that can be dovetailed into the existing plan, and is it a plan maybe where we want to if if we maybe beef it up and add some things, can we extend the original timeline on the plan and really just abridge the completion time to you know by a year by two years um, and just maybe expand the action steps a bit so we're going to be really unpacking it understanding reporting out to the board um, let's see where are we were October um, I would say that no later than December 1 you'd have an update and an audit in terms of where we were um, as well as some recommended additional action steps um, and then we'd really start kind of getting after it after the new year in terms of any action steps which we were looking to accomplish this year. Terry, I'm sorry. You are muted. Walking away here to myself. Okay. <laughs> okay, so number one, two, three, four, the fourth district goal. Um, Dr. Cascone, you provide it for the board's information um, in our packet. Um, uh, it's called REAP, Racial Equity Analysis Protocol. Mm -hmm. um, there was some really good stuff in there. Definitely. And I wish that perhaps we could share some of that with the public moving forward. And I also just want to remind everyone that when we engaged in the um, town hall, uh, with Dr. David Jones, we said, hold us accountable. And I, I think we're really holding ourselves accountable. We, we have covered a lot of territory in a short amount of time. Um, so I would like to commend my fellow board members. Um, it is the week of respect. So I respectfully um, <laughs> oh gosh, pat ourselves great. on the back and, and Dr. Cascone and his leadership. I, I think we've done a phenomenal job, as I said, in a very short amount of time in moving forward with uh, equity, diversity, and access. So that's my comment on the district goals. All right. Anything else? Seeing none, Mr. Calavano. Mrs. Merklinger? Yes. Mr. Rothstein? Yes. Mrs. Tunnicliffe? Yes. Vice President Trigg-Scales? Yes. 
President Alper. Yes. All right. Uh, next up, public comment on any topic at all. Again, three minutes. Let us know your name. Thank you. Yeah. As uh, Mr. Appler said, uh, once again, it's the raise your hand function uh, feature on the bottom of the screen. For our call in attendees, it is star nine. And again, you can push it at any time. You do not have to wait for anyone to finish talking. It will put you in a queue. And Melinda, if you can follow the uh, prompt again for me. Hello. Hi. Hello, Melinda Huerta, 17 Park Drive South, West Orange. Um, I thought we were done. I started eating dinner and everything, but I did forget to thank the, um, the board and, and Dr. Tescon. Um, I was very impressed to hear um, about the new program. Um, I did actually have another question. I know Dr. Tescon had mentioned at uh, prior meetings about uh, the Rutgers program. And I know he said that there were some type of technical difficulties with Rutgers, not us as a as a administration, but um, or as a district, I'm sorry. But uh, I, I wanted to know if he had any follow up on that. Uh, we had discussed it briefly uh, at a different meeting at a uh, Council of PTA meeting recently. And um, that's it. But thank you all. Um, and I hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Okay, thank you. And on the Zoom on the label, it just says Samantha. So uh, Samantha, if you can please follow the prompt on your screen and give us your name and address for the record, please. Hi, my name is Samantha. I'm just calling to, I'm um, just asking about PPE, how that's gonna work, with, if it will be available on the bus. Can we just have your name and address for the record, Samantha? My name is Samantha and um, can I speak to you privately after? about something regarding that? Speak to who? In, yeah. in the Zoom format, there's no easy way to do that, but you can okay. certainly send an email to the superintendent uh, or call his office or uh, me if you prefer uh, email and we can share with the board whatever your preference is. Okay, great, thank you. That, that was my only question, just about how that would work yep. and about if there will be masks will be provided, that's it. That's a good question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Aaron Kesselman, if you can please follow the prompt on your screen. Yes, uh, good evening, Aaron Kesselman, One Galloway Court. Uh, just had one quick question about if there's any tech updates regarding Chrome issues uh, with Zoom. I know I'm still having issues making sure that I'm around when it freezes up at various times for my daughter. So just wondering if there's any tech updates on that whether or not we're sticking with this or moving on to another platform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Kristen Russell, if you can please follow the prompt on your screen. Hello. Hi. Hi, uh, Kristen Russell, 53 Lawrence Avenue. Um, I also want to bring up about tech issues. We are now picking up our fourth Chromebook um, for my second grader tomorrow morning. Um, and we've also been told that these Chromebooks are not made to do Zoom and Google Classroom at the same time, which is what they're trying to do. Um, so my seven-year-old keeps getting kicked off. Um, we've had a lot of a lot of tech issues. Like I said, but we're literally going tomorrow morning to pick up our fourth machine. Um, so wondering if there is any update with that, what can we do about that? In the same vein, we have a kindergartner with the newer Chromebook, not a single issue. So I do think it's those Chromebooks that are older that are for like the first to fifth grade or whatever it is. Um, same house, same internet, no issues. Um, my other question was about any in-person meetings. Um, like meet and greets with the teacher. I know we that was something that had come up earlier um, that for elementary school they were going to do, but we've heard none of that, at least for our elementary school. Um, wondering if that will be happening, and if so, when. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda uh, Olvera, if you can please follow the prompt on your screen. Hi, this is Amanda Olvera, 23 Crystal Avenue. Um, 
I was just curious how the um, the teacher teams for fourth graders were going to work to allow that additional support for the hybrid model. Um, only because the way that I see it working right now is one teacher is responsible for language arts and social studies while the other is responsible for math and science. So one is teaching their subject while the other is teaching their subject. So I was just curious how that'll work um, to offer that additional teacher support when we do go into the hybrid model. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And do we have anyone else at this time? Use the raise your hand function. That seems to be it. All righty, uh, Dr. Cascoon. Thank you, Mr. Alper. Um, just just a few a few things um, with regard to uh, to Mrs. Huerta's uh, question. Uh, interestingly, after your question at the last board meeting, I did follow up with Mr. Plata to inquire as to the status of that, and was glad to hear that in fact it is moving forward. Uh, they held their first organizational meeting. Um, between Rutgers and our internal folks on October 1st um, and laid out um, a uh, an agenda and kind of a, a plan. I, I literally just got the email tonight from Mr. Plata a little, a little this afternoon and I have not had a chance to review it, but that is moving forward. And one thing that Mr. Plata did indicate to me in his email, which I'm just reviewing now, uh, was that they have an event planned for Saturday, October 24th at Washington School at 1 p.m., though they're still working out the details of the event. So, um, but we do have our liaison um, on board now and they are moving forward with the planning. So uh, I was not at that first meeting, not exactly sure why, um, but uh, Mr. Plata has ensured me that um, I will be um, invited to the, the, the successive meetings and this is an initiative that I, um, uh, I that I want to take a personal interest in and, and involvement in. So uh, you know, I will be attending those meetings moving forward. Uh, so yes, Ms. Huerta, we are pleased to, to uh, advise that uh, we are moving forward with that. As far as masks go, I think it's a good question, right? Um, which is in advance of that date, um, how can parents who need them um, get them? And, and, and I do think the answer to that is through the building principal and on the building level. We do have meetings tomorrow with elementary principals and secondary principals. And so we'll add that as an agenda item to just discuss through what's the best way to do that and ensure that, we, um, that, that we're getting them to, to parents and, and, and children who need them. But um, if, you know, um, uh, Shannon, if you wanted to, um, it was Sh Shannon, right? Was the Samantha. Samantha, I'm sorry. Uh, Samantha, um, uh, certainly if you want to reach out to me uh, privately by email, I I'm happy to chat with you. If, if you had more specific questions beyond what I just said, I'm happy to do that. Um, as far as the uh, the meet and greets, I mean, I think our, I, I think our, our, our energies are squarely <clears throat> focused now on really preparing to bring our cohorts of students in and and you know November 9th is is coming quickly it just as October has come quickly so I think um, before we know it um, you know students will be back and be in um, I mean that being said um, you know I would say that you know our buildings are open many of our teachers are in um, and so you know I think as parents if you were interested in having a, a parent teacher conference um, you know, we have spaces outside. If you felt like you wanted to have that individual contact with the teacher, um, that can certainly be arranged. But right now, our, our energies are very squarely focused on getting our cohorts of students in. That was kind of the charge that we heard from our community. It was the charge that came from the governor. Um, and that is really what we're working squarely on um, at, at this moment. Um, as far as Zoom goes, I know that the technology department is uh, continuing to um, to look at some workarounds to understand why that's happening. I, I think that uh, they are they are slowly, um, you know, coming to the conclusion as they as they um, rule out other factors that it is um, the Chromebooks themselves. I have spoken to Mr. Santiago, um, and uh, you know, have asked him to uh, to put in a purchase order and to get some additional units, which he has done. Um, you know, uh, in the interim, and we know it's an inconvenience, um, you know, but we'll continue to, to swap out and replace machines with newer units if we need to do that and work with you on that. I think, you know, while the, 
the ask was initially that you use a school district device and still that that's obviously the ideal um, but in the interim if you're able to utilize uh, a personal device at home um, you know you can do that um, I should note that that when you do that and and it's really for privacy issues because um, when your child is operating within the Google environment um, on on a personal computer it's important that you know that you log out of that account prior to using the computer for 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 personal business because if you're searching and logged in under your child's Google account then we we have access to that not that we're looking at it nor do we want to look at it but technically we can see that and it's in our in our archives and our cookies and and things of that nature um, and as far as the fourth grade support teacher, my understanding is that right now is that the second teacher will only be offered in grades pre-K through three. And the reasoning behind that is that is, you know, as students rise up at the fourth and fifth grade, their their ability um, to, to their self-agency and their ability to to remain engaged with simply the one teacher is greater. And the further we move down, really, the more a second teacher is necessitated in the room to you know to 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 facilitate the online platform you know while the other teacher is teaching um, but as they move up in grades the understanding and the expectation is that they have the self-agency and the responsibility um, to to do that um, so i do not believe and mrs demendez correct me if i'm wrong that there will be a co-teacher if you will in fourth and fifth grade mrs demendez Oh, okay. No worries. I, but I. No, I, she's a. Do I want to bring her back as a as a participant? She's she's in the attendee. Pool. Yeah, just to confirm sure. whether what I said is accurate. Okay, she's coming on over now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, so um, it is true that we will primarily have two teachers in grades pre K through three um, through three. However. The grade four and five teams are departmentalized, right. so they will, in effect, have two teachers working together. They just might, may not be in the same room, but they will facilitate that live um, instruction, one teacher in their room, and that second teacher would be facilitating the support from their room. So uh, it's like a three-teacher model. It's a little different, but there should be, in effect, a two-teacher support system for grades four or five. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Mendes. All right. I think uh, that's it, Mr. Alper. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, board member reports. Uh, Mr. Rothstein. All right. Uh, very brief tonight. Just uh, uh, wanted to uh, offer up thanks for the back to school night uh, this uh, previous week, which was really terrific. We really enjoyed it. So in my case, I've got a child at um, Roosevelt Middle School. Thank you to Mr. Hush and the faculty there. It was really well organized and easy to move around and well thought out and very informative and uh, we really enjoyed the whole thing. So I hope that all of the other parents in the district will have um, equally good experiences that we had uh, with ours. And um, the only other thing that I wanted to mention since Dr. Cascone opened up the whole dress code debate is that I will um, be reintroducing my plan of formal wear for all students. So but we can bring that up next week. And that's it. Ms. Trig Scales. I'll come back. Okay, so um, I'm just wondering where our student liaison is. Oh, start my video. Uh, our student liaison. Was she, he going to start in October? I don't recall. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Now, I don't want you telling me twice. I said, I like to <laughs> That's I'm waiting. I like it once. Waiting. That's why. I, um, so, um, I, coincidentally, at my, my equity council today with students, I, actually, a couple of the students inquired with me because they had, had, been in, had, a, had expressed an interest in it. So, um, how about this? 
I've, I vow to have our student liaisons present for the October 26th board meeting. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. What didn't I talk about? Okay. I noticed that um, in our assessment calendar that we're going to jump right in as soon as students get back. Um, can we kind of ease into that um, since they haven't been in school in a while that we do some some SEL stuff and assess where they are before we start assessing them academically? I, I just feel like we need to do that um, to kind of ease back into that, that it's not um, assessing as soon as they arrive. And I'm sure that's not what what we had in mind, but the calendar looks like that's going to start relatively soon. So that's just a, a comment. Um, I was wondering, uh, the PD for grades 6 through 12, I noticed um, we had information for K through 5 or pre-K through 5, but I, I couldn't see what we were doing 6 through 12. And this is a something that I had talked to Dr. Cascone about, but I just wanted to mention it for the benefit of my fellow board members. Um, attorney fees, being members of New Jersey School Boards Association, we have access to um, legal. And so I hope that we can take advantage of that more than we have in the past that we, um, if it's something that we can go through New Jersey school boards, we do that rather than going through our attorney, which can um, be an efficiency for us if we're not using the attorney for things that we don't absolutely have to. I know it would take more time to go through school boards, but if it's something that we can wait on for a while, I would like to recommend that we do that. Um, and let's see, I think I see we're going to gaggle, which I think is a wonderful thing for our students, especially during these times when folks are very fragile. Um, it gives us a heads up for students who are reaching out for help, but it also gives us a heads up for students who are being inappropriate. So I think that's a good safeguard for our students and our families so that our um, counselors as well as our administrators can be on top of it. Um, I think that's it. Um, yes, I think that's my list. I'm sure when I'm done, I'll go back and find <laughs> some other things. Oh, the Ed Camp. Um, you said, Dr. Cascone, there weren't a lot of participants. Do you know how many we had? Probably about 25 people there. Oh, that's a good start. Yeah. yeah. That's a good start. Great. Great. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. And right. kudos to everyone who presented tonight. Very, very um, informative presentations. And thank you to the public who showed up. All right. Ms. Mark um, so I'll keep it short tonight. I just want to recognize um, Samantha Galantini was named Junior Player of the Year by the NJPGA Junior Tour in the 11 to 15 year old category. So congratulations to Samantha. Um, I just want to echo Dr. Cascone had started off um, in his earlier board report um, about the football game and we were able to honor uh, Coach Sariano. So I just want to again um, express our condolences and our respect for the Sariano family. Um, he was truly a great coach. He coached not only myself but also my mom. So um, he holds a special place in our family's heart. Um, I just want to congratulate uh, all of our, our soccer teams. The boys and girls started off uh, last week and this week. Our football team, the cheerleading team, and the marching band all performed uh, Friday night, and it was great just to see everyone out there. But I also want to um, thank our custodian staff who were on site and kept things moving. Um, we had the portageons, and they were, you know, spraying them down after every person. Um, we had temperature checks going on, hand sanitizer. Um, everyone was maintaining their social distance and wearing masks. So it was just great to see. Um, everyone in the community adhering to the rules and being able to enjoy uh, the football game and the cheerleaders and again, you know, the marching band. So thank you to everyone that came out for that. Um, definitely want to thank our faculty and staff for World Teacher Appreciation Day. Um, you guys 
you're doing excellent and amazing things right now, and, and we're all in awe of your capable um, or your abilities right now. Um, and definitely, you know, I echo Gary with the, um, I've heard a lot of positive uh, feedback on the back to school nights and definitely interesting to see it done in a virtual format. So again, thank you to our staff um, for their efforts in that. Sit. All righty, Ms. Tunney. Thank you. Um, a few things I got to, um, attend two lunches this week. Uh, we did thank you lunches for our buildings and grounds and I went by to congratulate and thank everybody for all the extra work that they've been doing and are about to do coming up um, as we start bringing students back into the buildings. Um, and we also had a tech department lunch and as you know, this is a uh, this whole plan has been a very tech heavy plan. So, um, and they've been working how many days around the clock so uh, we had some thank you lunches for them and I got to participate in those um, wanted to give a shout out that love sick is going to be at OSPAC this weekend this is the high school production um, it'll be on October 15th and 16th at OSPAC at 8 p.m. Uh, tickets are available through the um, Wobo website and um, it'll be outside so bring your blankets and chairs uh, hope to see some of you there um, also Coming up that next week is the um, Colin Morgan Foundation golf outing and brunch. That while the golf outing is sold out, I believe the brunch still has tickets available. Uh, that'll be Monday, October 12th. So um, I believe that's also on the website um, to get tickets at. Um, last week, I also had an opportunity to take part in a CPAC meeting that they were holding to, that was kind of just a listening to concerns and to check in with our families of our special needs students to see how they were doing. Um, and I think one of the concerns that came up was also around Zoom and having students being able to still go outside of Zoom. And I know we talked about that at another meeting and I was wondering if there had been um, a decision made on whether we were gonna purchase that software that the teachers could put the link to Zoom into the software so the student couldn't go out and start roaming around in Zoom. So if I could get um, an, some input on that. And then also just wanted to remind everybody that tomorrow night is the West Orange High School back to school night on October 6th at 6.30 p.m and that'll be virtual and you should be getting a link from your student for that. So thank you so much. All right, um, you stole both of my plugs. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wobo.org slash lovesick, buy your tickets. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully I'll see you there and I'll see you at the Morgan Foundation brunch. Um, I think that is all. Um, our next meeting will be right here on the internet at 7.30 PM on October 26th. Uh, have a good night, we're adjourned. Thank you, System Form everyone, that when I end the meeting, it will end for those on screen and off screen and no other business will be conducted. Have a great night, everybody.